Good morning and welcome to another day in Maesot, Thailand. It is Thursday, May 14th, and I still haven't figured out how to uh, upload videos from my phone, let alone edit them on my phone. So we'll see what happens with this one. That will be my project for this afternoon. Take another stab at figuring out how to use an editing program on my phone and then upload it. Apparently, it can be done. Lots of people do it. I experimented a little bit and I ran into so many problems that I just wasn't able to figure out. Smartphones are kind of a mystery to me. In particular, how they manage files and where they store them and how you get access to them. <laughs> My experiment so far, I ran into some of the craziest problems. But uh, I'll keep plugging away at it and see what happens. My task for today is to uh, walk to a new uh, computer store that I found out about. I just did a quick Google search for Maysot, you know, type in computer shop, and I found one that's not too far away from my hotel, and I can walk there. Seems to be kind of a low-key place that does a lot of repairs and custom building of PCs from components that you select and I think they also sell uh, used laptops and things like that anyway seemed like a pretty good place to go just to check the place out I'm always interested in technology but I also want to as I said the other day assuming I uploaded that video I want to remove the hard drive from my broken laptop and somehow get it inside a, an enclosure and use it as a portable hard drive and hopefully find a way to um, access the files on it and I might be able to recover some uh, videos that I was working on when my laptop crashed. I suspect that will not be as easy as I've been led to believe from my research online. It's not like you can just remove that hard drive, plug it in and your entire file structure will be sitting there just as it was on your computer. I don't think it works that way. Partially because I think when you plug it in, you're going to run into permissions problems. Like you won't be able to just access the folder structure. You need it to be attached to Windows and your Windows account and all these sorts of things in order to get at it. But I think there are special programs out there that you can download for free or buy them and they kind of crack that system for you to give you access to those uh, files and folders. I don't know. But it's not like I uh, have anything else to do today. So here I am heading towards a, another computer shop and hopefully I have a better experience there than I did at my uh, first one. Let's see, uh, what else is going on? Oh. <laughs> Getting run over by scooters today, not being attacked by dogs. Let her uh, get by me. I mentioned the other day that someone much smarter than me suggested a solution to my problem with having to get a stamp on the back of passports. She found out that I can just write by hand on the back of them, and I did that this morning, so that worked out really well. <laughs> it's kind of funny because I went to a shop and I wasn't sure what kind of pen would work. So I bought a selection of five different pens just to make sure one of them would be able to write on a photo and the ink wouldn't smear. And I did an experiment this morning. And out of the five pens that I bought, it's a lucky thing I bought five of them, only one of them would work. All of the others, the ink was too wet and it smeared. Um, or had other problems, so they wouldn't work at all because they were such cheap pens. But one of the pens, a genuine paper mate, I think, it actually worked, and I could write the name of the uh, photo studio on the back. Anyway, this smart person suggested this morning that maybe it's not such a bright idea to try to renew my passport from Mesot. I thought it was great that I could send it in by courier, 
and then wait here for them to send me my new passport back. But after she put some ideas into my head, I realized I don't really need to do that. I think eventually I will end up in Bangkok no matter what I do. You know, even if another country opens up, chances are you can't go there by land border. You're going to have to fly there anyway. So I'll have to go to Bangkok. Um, yeah, I was going through all the options in my head and I don't want to go to Bangkok right this second or even maybe not even next week. But it seems like no matter what happens, I will end up in Bangkok no matter what. So if I'm going to go there anyway, I might as well just wait and renew my passport when I get there so I can physically go to the Canadian Embassy and if there are any issues with my application, you know, we can deal with them right on the spot. <laughs> For example, I'm still struggling with passport photos. The first set I got, my head was way too big, I think, depending on how you interpret the uh, dimensions. And my second set, just snuck in under the wire, I think. They reached the minimum size, so that's okay. But I was so disappointed with my first set because I looked a million years old and I looked really grim and unhappy because for a passport photo, you're not supposed to smile. You have to have a neutral expression. So for my second set of photos, I allowed myself to have just the smallest grin, like just a tiny uptick of my the corners of my mouth to make it look like I'm not actually in pain or a criminal or something. But now when I look at the photos, I'm wondering whether I took it too far. You know, I, if the embassy staff interpret that picture as me smiling, they will reject it. So I've got this issue of, are the photos the right size? And Am I smiling too much in the photo? In the past, I've always dealt with this by going to the embassy. And then I'm sitting right across from the clerk taking my application. And what I would do is just spread out a whole bunch of photos in front of them and say, pick the best ones. Like, which ones of these are the right size, the right color, the right style. And then they would, on the spot, pick out a good one. And it was the same for filling out the forms because these forms are pretty good. They're from the Canadian Embassy and they're quite professional. But at the same time, they're designed for people who are in Canada. So for example, there are questions like, what is the intended date of your travel? And you must fill this out. But for me, that question doesn't make any sense because I'm not in, I'm already here. Technically, I'm already traveling. So what do I put in for my intended date of travel? Do I write in now? Do I write in, I have no idea what to fill out in that form, right? And there are so many spaces on that form similar to that, where there's no obvious answer for me. I don't know what to write down because my life is pretty irregular and I don't often fit the categories that they offer, you know? So in the past, I would just go to the embassy and tell the guy, like, I have no idea how to answer this question. And then he would tell me right away, oh, just write this down. Oh, just write this down. And there was always an answer, but it was an, it was an unusual answer, you know? So I think I've concluded that I'm not going to send my uh, passport application in by courier. I'm going to just hold off for a bit, see when I end up in Bangkok, and then I'll just do it in person. Feels like a better option. Oh. I've reached the intersection where I have to turn left this way to uh, get to this computer store. Just a couple hundred meters ahead, I think. Hopefully uh, this will work out okay. <laughs> yeah, what else has been going on? Um, since I lost my laptop, I haven't been following as many foreigners overseas as I used to, all the stranded foreigners. 
But there was a new couple that I've been following their story. They're, you know, YouTubers, of course, and they call themselves Travel Bums or Travel Bum. I'll put a link in the description. It's a young couple from the United States and they got stranded in Cusco in Peru. And I guess there are always good and bad things about any place you could get stranded. I mean, Cusco is a gorgeous city. I, I've been there myself. I went there so many years ago, it feels like another lifetime, and it's probably quite different today. But they ended up renting Airbnb apartments, kind of long term, a few weeks at a time, perhaps. And uh, these Airbnb places were up on the hillside on the edges of Cusco. So the best thing about these places was the uh, unbelievable views they got. I mean, every day just looking out over the gorgeous city of Cusco with the Andes Mountains in the background. Absolutely stunning. And they have a very nice place to stay. And on top of that, they were adopted by a local dog. Uh, kind of a big, friendly, yellow lab mix or something like that, I don't know. And they, this dog just started following them everywhere. They fed him once or twice. So the dog decided, okay, you are now my family. <laughs> and no matter where they go, this dog goes with them. And they've kind of adopted him in turn. And they've called him Mr. Potato Head. So if you watch their videos, you get lots of amusing sequences of Mr. Potato Head uh, following them around Cusco with his tail wagging and his butt going from side to side. Yeah, I don't know their full story. Um, they said something in, in their most recent video. Oh, huh. not sure where this computer store is. Got to back up. Um, I think they just started on some kind of a big around the world journey recently. So Peru might even have been their very first stop. And if so, you know, they're wondering whether they made the right decision. <laughs> I mean, they set off on this trip and then boom, first thing they got stuck in uh, Cusco, unable to go anywhere. I think they were talking about this because of a Q&A session that they did. And somebody asked them whether they regretted leaving on this trip. And they said that, well, if they knew this lockdown was going to occur, they would not have gone to Peru, you know, on the dates that they did. They would have stayed in the United States and delayed their departure. But yeah, their story is uh, quite interesting, how they're getting food there. Certainly the lockdown in Cusco seems much more severe than it ever has been here in Mesot. The streets just seem completely empty. Even at the height of the social distancing regulations here in Mesod, the town still felt largely open and active, but Cusco looks completely like a uh, ghost town. Anyway, I gotta check my uh, Google Maps here because this computer store should be right here. And as you can see, there's nothing here that looks anything like a uh, computer store. I made a wrong turn. Better check Google Maps, see where I am. Aha, uh -huh, I think I found it. Right there on the corner. According to Google Maps, the name of the place in English is the Tor Computer Shop, T-O-R. And maybe that's why I missed it first time, because I don't see you know, the word Tor anywhere. It's all uh, written in Thai. Oh. All right, I'm gonna go uh, inside, uh, turn off the GoPro and uh, see what uh, they have to say in there. So there is the inside of my poor laptop. This is where the, uh, the hard drive was, and the technician here just uh, removed it. 
and he's putting it inside one of these uh, cases right here. Hard drive uh, enclosure. Hmm. So far, it seems like uh, it's a very simple process and he's just doing it right now. But whether it will be as easy to get the files off this hard drive, that uh, I don't know. Maybe they can do that for me here too. Check this out. He uh, plugged in my hard drive right there into this fancy computer and it my hard drive instantly came up as healthy and then he just had to click on my username and I guess he has a special program already installed that's uh, cracking it so this might have been a very uh, successful little errand run and they don't sell new computers here but they do sell this a collection of used ones and these ones are all core i5 processor models with four gigabytes of ram and one of these would probably work just fine for basic computing but they're probably not powerful enough for my purposes right now I don't do fancy video editing, but I'm kind of tired with how underpowered my old computer was. I want something with a bit more power. What a difference. Why didn't I come to this computer shop first? I would have had such a nice experience, a much better experience here. Yeah, online, like I said, they, it's called Tor, T-O-R, if you're ever in Mesod and uh, you need something worked on, this would be a good place to start, I think. Yeah, they're uh, still decoding my hard drive to give me access to the files. They say it'll take uh, 10 minutes. First, they were joking that it might take an hour. Maybe they weren't joking, we'll see. And then they gave me a nice cold bottle of water and they brought out a stool for me to sit on. So, <laughs> excellent uh, customer service. Oh, so good. Ice cold. That's what makes uh, Canadians happy. In fact, my other errand for today is to buy ice cube trays because uh, <laughs> I do have a mini fridge in my room and I haven't been using the freezer partially because the whole thing was frosted over. You know, it was completely sealed because of a buildup of ice and frost. But yesterday I defrosted the whole thing and now I can make uh, ice cubes if I want. So I just have to go find uh, ice cube trays. That'll be my other project for today. For anyone out there that is uh, technically minded, the program I've been trying to use on my phone is called InShot. And that's what the screen looks like there, the uh, editing screen. I chose it because it was recommended, but it was also considered to be, you know, the most simple of all of the good options out there. And I need something simple. I'm not doing, you know, five different audio tracks and video layers and all that kind of stuff. I don't need any of those capabilities. This one basically just takes a bunch of video clips, sticks them together, and then you can trim the edges and cut them and things like that. And that's pretty much all I need. It has one neat feature actually, which is an interesting model for making money, which I hadn't encountered before. Because if you just use InShot by itself, the video it exports has a watermark on it that says InShot. So it's advertising for them. But if you want to get rid of that, you can either pay them a fee, you know, a one-time fee of like $4, and then they remove the, water, the watermark completely. Or if you don't want to do that, you can remove the watermark per video just by watching an ad. So you get this little message that says, do you want to remove the watermark for free? And if you do, and you click yes, then they show you an ad. And then you watch the ad or look at the ad, and then you go back to the video, and the watermark is gone. So it's kind of a, a unique approach. I hadn't seen that before. It means you can get rid of watermark, but then you end up watching a lot of ads too. Interesting. The problem with InShot for me is that when you want to trim the video, it's not very precise. I'm used to another program where I can just watch the video, 
pause it right where I want the video to start. And then I can just click a button and say, start here. But InShot is different. You can watch the video and pause it, but then you can't select that as a starting point. You have to grab the handle on the side, the trim handle, and pull it into that point. But it's really kind of hit or miss. I mean, you could miss that point by two or three seconds in either direction. So it's a very imprecise way of uh, editing. And I don't know why they do it that way. But anyway, that's what I'm having trouble with. But uh, we'll see. I'll experiment more this afternoon. Mm. We're still working on uh, decoding all of my files on my hard drive. Still working away there. But so far, no error messages or anything like that. So everything's working uh, cool. Could this be a turning point? Could it be a change towards good luck for Doug? I don't know. But it wasn't looking good there for a while. I just came out of the computer shop and they plugged my hard drive into their big fancy machine and we're running some kind of a decryption data recovery program. And um, they told me it wouldn't work. We waited and waited and waited. And they restarted it several times and uh, the recovery process got to a certain point and then it just got hung. All you got was that little circle spinning around and around and around. And we waited and waited and waited and they restarted it over and over. And they finally told me, now there's a problem with the hard drive. You know, the, all the data on it has been so badly corrupted that they can't recover it. And I thought, yeah, that sounds... <laughs> For me, that sounds about right. I mean, that's what would happen in my case. In fact, when I got my, finally got my laptop back from the first shop, I brought it back to my hotel room and just for fun, I thought I would um, plug it in and see whether it would turn on. You know, I don't know. Weirder things have happened. Boy, this is a... Uh, busy street. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so I thought, I don't know, they've been working on it. Maybe they did something. Just for fun, I thought I would plug it in, hit the power button, see whether the laptop turned on. So I went to turn it on. I went to plug it in. And when I plugged it in, the whole thing blew up. Sparks flew in all directions. And I quickly unplugged it. So whatever they had done to the laptop while they were trying to repair it, had uh, <laughs> had made it worse. Anyway, maybe they just didn't put it back together afterwards and there was a short circuit all over the place. But whatever happened, the thing was sending sparks in all directions and I quickly unplugged it. So I was thinking maybe it was me plugging it back in that caused the damage to the hard drive. And that too would be par for the course. But then my luck turned and the guy, the main technician there, he had gone out to get something to drink. And maybe while he was out getting this drink, he was thinking things through and he came up with an idea. He came back, he went back to their big uh, computer, their big machine, fiddled with something, hit the data recovery program again. And within three minutes, boom, it was finished. And uh, they stepped away from the computer and said to me, you know, sir, would you like to check to make sure that all the documents are there? And I really appreciated that too. You know, that spoke to me of real professionalism because, I mean, this was my hard drive, all my documents. There's nothing bad on my hard drive, but they don't know that, or maybe it's proprietary information. They don't know. So even though they were working on the hard drive, once they had cracked it, they didn't touch it. As soon as it was cracked and it was open, they stepped away from the computer and they said to me, you go, look on the hard drive, open up the folders, look around and see if everything is still there. So I did that. And I thought that was a very um, nice touch. Told me that these guys were uh, professional. Because it's something I would do as well, you know, if I were a technician working on someone's laptop and you know, I got it to run. 
I'm not going to suddenly go rummaging around their hard drive to see what they've stored there. I would, you know, okay, I've opened it. It's none of my business. Let the customer look. So, so I got on there and I looked and um, everything was there. Like all of my YouTube videos, all of the files, all of the photographs, all of the, uh, all, everything was there. The whole thing was exactly as if I was looking at my own file structure on my old laptop. So, that's good news. Um, I have it here in my bag now. They charged. This is an, another amazing thing about being in Asia that perhaps people in uh, North America don't realize is that quite often when you buy an object in Asia, whatever it is, like a muffler for your scooter, or in my case, an enclosure for my hard drive, they throw in the labor for free. So in this case, I mean, all I paid for was the enclosure. All I paid for was the little case that you put the hard drive into. And the price for that was 350 baht. And, but on top of that, the technician, he opened my computer he took out the hard drive, he put it into the enclosure, and on top of that, he plugged it into their system and ran a decryption program and recovered, uh, like a data recovery program, and uh, recovered all of my files. So, he did a lot, and he didn't charge me for any of that. All I had to pay for was the object, the case that I bought. In Canada, I can tell you, that's not gonna happen. Sure, you can buy a case if you want, but that's all you're gonna get for your 350 baht. You can buy the case and then you can walk out the door. If you want them to open up your laptop, that's a service charge. Removing the hard drive, that's a service charge. Data recovery, that's a serious uh, service charge. I mean, it, can you imagine how valuable that is to a customer, like even to someone like me? He basically recovered my entire data set going back months and months and months. I mean, if I were a real professional of some kind, that could be worth tens of thousands of dollars, right? So a company would normally charge you a hefty fee to recover all the data on a hard drive. And in this shop, that was all just uh, thrown in for free. And it's the same for the other example I mentioned when I was in uh, Taipei, if you brought a scooter into a shop to get, you know, to buy a new tire or buy new brakes or buy a new muffler, all you paid for was the muffler and they would just put the scooter up on the hoist, remove the old muffler and put on the new one at no extra charge. So labor was always included in the price of whatever it was you were buying. and. Uh, Compared to Canada, where they charge you for everything, you know, they'll charge you for the oxygen you breathe while you're inside their store. It's a really nice in this part of the world when you run into that. Feels good and obviously it's a lot more economical for the uh, customer. With all this happiness surging inside me from recovering all the files on my hard drive, I think I'm going to go reward uh, myself or at least keep that feeling going with a bubble milk tea. And uh, since I was heading towards the bubble milk tea shop, it kind of reminded me of a story from a couple of days ago. I went to that shop and while I was uh, heading towards it, I came across a big lineup of people. I did a rough count and I'd say there was maybe a thousand people in the lineup, but I, I didn't see the beginning of it. So I don't even know how far it went and where it ended. So it could have been as many as 1500 people. And they, these people were jammed together. I mean, it was a lineup that stretched for block after block after block. And every single person in the line was pushed physically up against the person in front of them. You know, it was like a, a crowd and they're all just jammed together, physically touching everyone else around them in line. So, of course, the first thing you think of is, uh, you know, in this day and age, that's, that can't be good for uh, social distancing, you know? And I asked around 
And I found out that this was a lineup of people who were trying to get a uh, government handout of cash. I, I couldn't find out how much money was given to each person or to each family. Um, but apparently there was a distribution point for this government handout here at this uh, temple. I'm kind of uh, right beside this temple. Quite well known here in uh, Mesot. You know, right over there. And this lineup of people came from the street behind me and then went all the way down here and then around the corner. So I don't know how far it went. But anyway, a lot of people showed up to get this uh, money that they were offered, you know, from the uh, government. It was really quite something to see. Mainly women and children in the lineup. So there'd be like a woman with four or five children in a group and they're all just kind of pushed up against the people in front of them. The interesting thing was that um, they anticipated this crowd to a certain extent and there were police everywhere because this lineup was so big it crossed so many streets that it was blocking traffic and the police had to come out and station themselves at every intersection and keep people back and then get cars to go through and then let people in the lineup cross the street. So it was uh, pretty chaotic. But I was thinking that if there were, you know, a thousand or a thousand five hundred people in that lineup and you tried to impose social distancing of two meters between each person oh what's that two meters times uh that's like yeah three kilometers i think so the whole lineup would have stretched three kilometers it would have gone right through the city and out into the countryside just about it would have been such a long lineup so you couldn't really have had two meters between every person it would have been unfeasible Anyway, I've got a little shop here. I'm going to look for an ice cube tray and then I'm going to go get my bubble milk tea. Here's a small example of what I was talking about earlier. These water bottles. You often see water bottles lined up along the outside of shops here. Today, there's only two of them, but quite often at night, there might be 50 bottles along here. And they're all old bottles like this one. And they're either half filled or all the way filled with water. And I have no idea what they're for. A lot of shops in uh, Mesot do that. Even little coffee shops will have a big square of water bottles around their shop on the outside. I'm sure it has some kind of significance, but I don't know what it is. Someone told me online that they were there for the police to like at night they can get a drink of water, but I'm pretty sure that's not true because these bottles are really old and dirty. Some of them are moldy. I think the point is just to have water in them and they sort of have a symbolic purpose, maybe warding off bad luck or ghosts or something. That's my guess. Maybe they're meant to ward off mosquitoes or dogs, I, I have no idea but I see it all the time all over Mesot. The mystery of the water bottles outside the uh, business. I'm almost at my bubble milk tea shop. I've discovered that if you come in the morning, it's too early because they're still cooking the bubbles. If you come in the afternoon, it's too late because all the bubbles are finished. Right now it's 1 p.m. and I think that is perfect bubble time. So let's see. And there it is there. Taiwan milk tea with bubbles. Hello. The force is strong with me today, the bubble force. I've got my uh, bubble milk tea, very happy about that. I'll take this back to my room at the hotel. I'll settle in there and I'll show you my new exciting hard drive enclosure. So many exciting things today. And that will be the end of this video. Stay tuned for the big reveal. Just another random thought that popped into my head before I get back to the hotel. I went into this big store on the corner. They sell a lot of um, 
household goods and plastic items. You can sort of see it behind me there. And I was hoping they would have uh, ice cube trays. If any place would have them, they would. But unfortunately, no, they don't have any uh, ice cube trays. <laughs> and that could set me off on another week-long mission of just trying to find ice cube trays. And that gets back to a, a long-standing theme of mine of how uh, errands, when you run them overseas, take so much more time than they would if you were in your home country. Just because you're not familiar with, uh, you know, where you can buy certain things and then where you can't. There's another shop, maybe I'll take a look in there. They might have ice cube trays. No, no ice cube trays there. <laughs> but I was just thinking that ever since I've been overseas, it's like I've been on a quest for small objects, like a never ending quest. There's always something I want and it's generally so difficult to find. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous how out of balance that is because it's really not that important. It's just some tiny little thing that, oh, I could use some of that. And then you end up spending far more time thinking about it and trying to find it than is reasonable. So right now I had this idea, huh, ice cube trays, that would be nice. But I don't know where to go to find them in Thailand. In Canada, of course, I know exactly what store to go to and how much they would cost and where they are. But here in Thailand, I don't have a clue. Maybe they don't even have ice cube trays here. Maybe they're not common, I have no idea. <laughs> but another thing recently is such, it's so, so stupid, I hardly, I hardly even want to mention it. But I like to have a roll of scotch tape in my bag. You know, like a roll of scotch tape with one of those dispensers where you can just peel off a little bit and then cut it off. And I cannot find those anywhere. Like in 7-Eleven here and in every other shop, you can buy rolls of scotch tape, like actual branded scotch tape, high quality invisible tape. But none of it is ever in one of those handy dispensers, you know, like one of those small household dispensers. They just sell rolls of tape, you know, bare rolls. <laughs> so that's what I have in my bag, but I keep thinking, I wish I had one of those little dispensers and I've kept my eyes open for one of those things for what feels like months now, and uh, I've never seen them anywhere. So <laughs> it is kind of weird. You go overseas to another country and you think you're going to have all kinds of deep and meaningful thoughts about culture and language and the meaning of life and uh, in the end I end up thinking about ice cube trays and scotch tape. What are you gonna do? Just trying to cross the road and it's never very easy even in uh, sleepy Mesot You've always got vehicles coming at you from all different directions. There we go. But usually as soon as I get a break in traffic from this direction, there will be traffic from the other direction, but no. Nope. Looks like uh, I can make it now. <laughs> Look at this guy. If I kept walking, he would have impaled me with that uh, bamboo ladder. Which basically means no dull moment in uh, Thailand, or Myanmar, or Philippines, or Indonesia, or wherever you find yourself in this part of the world. And I guess that's what makes it interesting. Whew. Time to head into my room, cold shower, and then bubble milk tea. And for anyone who hasn't seen this from a previous video, this is kind of what the interior of this hotel looks like. They have all of these uh, teak carvings 
over the entire length of the, uh, the hallways and the ceilings here. So they have these like giant uh, catfish with fins sticking out to the side. And the stairwell, stairwells are very wide. Uh, huge teak banisters, wooden paneling, and then these uh, huge windows at the end. And there's more of the uh, teak carvings. Nice uh, centerpiece here for the light. And as you walk down the hallway, you can see just how much there is. I mean, just imagine all of this uh, teak. It's pretty amazing. And there's my room. And here we are, my bubble milk tea. big uh, bubble straw you get with it. So I've got the tea going. And this is the star of the show, my Glink HDD external 2.5 inch enclosure. They didn't have any uh, other ones there. This was like the only one that they carried. So it was like a simple decision just to get this one because there was no other uh, choice. Ooh. And there it is. Plain black. Yikes. <laughs> I can feel the hard drive rattling around in there. So that's not a good sign. So it was not exactly uh, placed inside very uh, carefully. This probably was not the best enclosure for it. There's no way your hard drive is supposed to rattle around like that. But <clears throat> yeah, and it comes with a little uh, USB cable. It's not a big hard drive. My computer only had um, 500 gigabyte hard drive when I bought it. But that means it's the end of my computer because it doesn't even have a hard drive in it anymore. It is completely toast. And that is it. I'm going to sit down, enjoy my bubble milk tea and uh, see if I can transfer these files from the GoPro over to my phone. A problem I discovered is that with a GoPro, of course, how could it be any other way? If I take the memory card from the GoPro and just attach it to my phone with a, you know, a USB cord kind of thing, a, a OTG cable, it won't work. I get an error message that says that this card has not been partitioned in a way that my phone can understand, which makes sense because the GoPro formatted it and, and set it up in such a way that only a GoPro can read it. So the only way I can get any files from my GoPro to the phone is using the GoPro app. And then I have to do it one file at a time that goes into the phone's internal dedicated memory. And then once that file is done, then I have to transfer it over to the SD card memory for whatever reason. GoPro does not allow you to save the files directly to the SD card. It will only go into the phone's main memory. And of course, I don't have, you know, 10 gigabytes of memory available in the phone's internal memory. I mean, who does? So I have to do it one file at a time. Technology, you know, it's uh, how, how and why they set it up the way they do. I'll never understand, but that's the way it is. And uh, luckily I have a bubble milk tea to keep me company while I do it. And assuming I ever upload this video, that's it. It's the end of my errands for today. And I'll see you in the next video with another Mesot update. See you then.